Welcome to Microsoft Dev Radio. We're, uh, we're back with Rory Preddy and our friends from Red Hat, as well as Nick Zhu from Microsoft. Uh, we've got Mohit Suman and Roland Grunberg from Red Hat. We're going to be talking about a project that uh, we've all been working on together for a while, um, Java by Red Hat on Visual Studio Code. And I'm going to just go ahead and turn it over to uh, Mohit and Nick, and they're going to tell us about the sort of the history of the project here. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good morning from wherever you are joining us. And today, the demo, what we want to have is the one with the VS Code Java. This is mostly around demonstrating what we have done in the past few years around the VS Code Java extension, making the life of the developers around Java the experience more easy, more fruitful, and making it more awesome. So this is 1.0 release. And with us today, we have uh, Nick, who is a senior product manager at Microsoft, Roland, who is a principal software engineer for Red Hat, and Rory, who is a senior cloud advocate from Microsoft, and myself, Mohit, and the product manager and developer experience at Red Hat. So we are going to go through some of the slides, uh, just giving a brief introduction, what we want to do, uh, how we have achieved this milestone, what are the features, what we have for the extension, and then we'll quickly jump on to a very awesome demo prepared by Roland with respect to the VS Code Java features. And then we'll hand over to Rory Preddy, who is uh, just going to uh, showcase how we work with the language server protocol and other cool features associated with it. So I'll quickly jump onto the first slide I have. Uh, giving a brief introduction of Java language server, uh, I'll start with how it started. Uh, this was something around uh, five years back in May 2016. The idea was to implement a language server protocol based on the uh, LSP, what we have for Eclipse ID. That's a full-blown Java ID. We already have that in the Eclipse support. We wanted to give the same performance and features for the Visual Studio Code uh, users. Uh, recently, we have seen from the Stack Overflow uh, survey that VS Code is one of the most used uh, IDs and developers really like it. And so we wanted to target the Java developers who are using VS Code to make it more awesome and useful for them, having whatever uh, new features we want to roll out. So slowly, slowly, we started building on top of it. And this started with a collaboration between Red Hat and Microsoft. And there were other community members, starting from Code and and IBM, who worked together. And we officially had a first release of language support for Java for VS Code around 2016, August. And that's what we started. Uh, it currently has the uh, highest number of downloads for the extension supported by Red Hat. Uh, it's approximately around 12.8 million downloads, and people are very excited to use it. Uh, last month, we had a official 1.0 release. By 1.0, we mean that whatever features we thought should be there uh, uh, to support a proper developer experience for users is there. Uh, we wanted to make VS Code and Java workflow to be fun as very much useful. And if you see, in the last three weeks of the release of 1.0, the extension has approximately seen up more than 2 million installs which means the uh, extension is very much loved by the developer community. They are trying to use it. They are having feedback around it, and there's a very strong community developed. And definitely 1.0 is not the end game. The development still continues. We are continuously adding more features. There's a very strong collaboration between Red Hat and Microsoft, and that will be showcased today in the demo it's also. Um, I'll just pass on to the next one. So this slide basically is a brief technical uh, and understanding what exactly is a JDT language server. Uh, by this, I mean, this is a specific uh, language implementation of LSP protocol uh, that can be used by any editor that supports this protocol. And we have tried to implement this in the VS Code uh, scenario so that uh, we have a very good support for the language. Uh, there are multiple scenarios with the server supports. It starts with Eclipse LSP 4J, which is needed for the Java binding uh, for the LSP protocol. The other one is there are multiple scenarios of covering code completion, references, diagnostics, which is directly done by the Eclipse JDT. Uh, the source code is on GitHub, and uh, I think uh, Rory is going to focus more on that. So we'll see those uh, slides in, uh, in the next demo coming forward. We also have a support from Maven, Gradle, Kotlin, and other stuff. And these are some of the uh, build shape and M2 Eclipse, which are helpful for us to support those scenarios. So this was just a brief that how the language server uh, is uh, a basic understanding. But I think once we deep dive in the demos, we'll have more understanding that how it works and how we try to incorporate this in the VS Code Java extension we have. 
moving forward, I'll pass on to Nick uh, just to uh, help us that how the ecosystem of the Java and Visual Studio Code is currently and what's the future roadmap. Uh, pass on to you, Nick. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mohit. Uh, thanks for that brief uh, background history on the VS Code Java. So the Java support on uh, VS Code has gone through many iterations since the initial release of the Java language server. Now our uh, Java language extension pack basically offers all the central features you would expect to see in a traditional Java IDE. So the backbone of our Java extension is the language server, which is the main top, top topic of our talk. This ensures that we deliver all the fundamental experience, including code completion, navigation, refactoring, and provides the foundation for our debugger, test runner, and project manager extensions. We will continue to make this a big focus of our product as the fundamental dev experience has a huge impact on developers' daily work routine with Java projects. In addition, we realized that the build tools is a big part of the Java dev experience. So now we have supported both Maven and Gradle on VS Code Java. This includes basic Maven and Gradle project import, project creation from scratch, customer goals and tasks, and so on. So in the next few quarters, we're working on providing more Maven experience, expanding our features to Gradle. So thanks for the thanks to the nature of VS Code and Language Server, the frameworks we, we support for VS Code Java are extensible and flexible. We have support for Swing, Spring Framework, uh, Krakus, and so on. Those frameworks support are in the form of extensions, and developers can choose to install the extensions they are interested in. Last but not least, Visual Studio Code also offers IntelliCode feature, which can improve developers' pr productivity by recommending code blocks based on AI suggestions. So there are lots of other features, but we're not going to list every single detail. So if you're interested in getting the latest products on the VS Code Java, uh, please visit the official developer blog from both uh, Microsoft and Red Hat, and the links are on the lower left corner. Can we, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so going forward, uh, we have planned many, many items for the Java language server on VS Code. Code completion experience is one of our top focus, and we plan to provide smarter and faster code completion. We will also look into more convenient code actions and refactoring operations. In addition, we want to make it easier to configure compiler errors, warnings, and code formatting options. Also, we would like to continue improve, improving the overall performance and reliability of the Java language server. So for those who are new to VS Code and Java, we target to provide a better getting started experience, including embedded JDK in the extension. Lastly, we hope to deliver a better Kotlin experience in the future as well. So again, you can visit those two blog links to get our latest updates. So let's go to the next one. Yeah, thanks. So before we start the demos, I just want to quickly mention the central piece uh, where all the magic is happening. I believe by now many developers are already familiar with the Visual Studio Code, which we usually just call VS Code. It's a lightweight uh, code editor by nature, but also contains some of the important IDE features. So being highly customizable and extensible, VS Code is designed to integrate with the developer's existing tool chains. And currently there are over 34K extensions on the marketplace. In addition, VS Code is developed in, uh, in an open source code base and released as a service to developers. So the, uh, the VS Code community has been growing tremendously fast over the last few years. And now we have over 90 million actor, active uh, developers using VS Code for their projects. So together with Microsoft and Red Hat, we will continue to ship many, many new features for Java support on VS Code. Yeah. So next I'm going to hand back to Mohit uh, to uh, introduce our demo part. Yeah, uh, no, thanks, Nick. Uh, okay. So, uh, guys, I think it's the time for us to deep dive into the demo. Uh, before starting with the demo, I just want to brief you about that what exactly we are going to cover. So, this will have a, a, 
a short overview of what uh, VS Code Java brings to the table, how the extension is, how we can download it from the VS Code Marketplace, and support of Java 17, Gradle, Kotlin, and how it's easier for us to see the performance improvements, what we have done in all the releases we have done till date, and, and what are the future roadmaps, what we have planned in the coming months. So these are some of the briefs which we have for the extension, and I'll pass on to Roland to take us through this journey. So Roland, Thank over you very to much. You. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you sound great. Show right, us what you got. Good. First of all, um, I just wanted to say thank you to Mohit and Nick for that very comprehensive introduction to the various features. I just add that um, in some of the future plans, that uh, slide, um, you can think of it as things that are very much coming very soon. There's a lot of things in there that we're not just thinking about or you know planning on. They're they're going to hit the release, uh, the next release very soon. So um, I'm really happy with uh, what we've got there and um, a lot of the interactions we've had with Microsoft and getting some of these awesome things uh, in there. So with that out of the way, let's just get to the demo stuff. So um, I'll minimize the screen and I'm hoping you can see a VS Code um, editor open. So just yep. give me a awesome. Looks good. So from what you can see here, um, I've got VS Code Java. I think one of the things that Nick touched upon is that again, this is an ecosystem, so you don't, it's not just VS Code Java, it's, you know, the test runner, the debugging extension, uh, project management. There's a lot of stuff that's built on top of VS Code Java, and um, I think that's one of the other things that makes this ecosystem really uh, nice. So um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to open up a project. Um, so I'll go to open folder here. Again, you can do a lot of these things through hotkeys, but um, I just like to show it very nicely uh, for this demo. So I'll just open this one up called JSON example. So essentially what this is, it's an unmanaged project. And what that means is it, it's not a Maven project. It's not um, a Gradle project. It's simply a folder that um, has Java source files. So it's, it's very straightforward and very easy to get started with a really, really basic project. I'll just click on uh, the main class here. And you can automatically see at the bottom right, I hope that there's a spinning little icon indicating that the language server has already started up um, and is loading uh, the project. So it's really, really easy to get set up. Um, that's, I think, one of the strong points here. You don't sort of have to trick the language server or the extension into kind of importing your project in a certain way. You don't need specific um, metadata files. You can start off with literally a folder in Java sources and you're good to go. Um, one of the things you can probably see here is um, that you see uh, Java SE 17 as a little uh, notification. So this is to indicate that on the system, the extensions found uh, a version of Java. And in this particular case, it's using Java uh, 17 for this. And you can sort of see that I have certain source files here that are um, you know using uh, language features from java 17. Um, let me just confirm something so um, i guess one of the things i should probably mention is that uh, you don't have to be using uh, java 17. Um, you can use whatever uh, version of java you want and it's it's a point i sometimes i don't mention sometimes i will mention but um, actually, let me just figure this out. Java configuration runtime. So I just clicked on the Java SE 17 uh, little notification down there. And if I just click this uh, setting, Java configuration dot runtimes, um, you can see that I can switch from the default of Java 17, I can switch it to Java 1.8. Uh, and if I save, you should probably see a bunch of errors because naturally I'm using uh, some features that are above Java 8. So I'll just switch this back. But it's just a point I feel is worth mentioning. Regardless of what runtime we're using for our own tooling, you can use whatever Java version you want. All right. So with that out of the way, I think, you know, let's open up um, a new Java source file and let's try and play around with this. So I'll just click um, on this sub package here. I'll right click. I'll go to new file, and essentially this is a project that's just sort of, you know, listing out certain kinds of items that are available probably in a store. So uh, let's create one called decor.java. 
And you can see instantly that um, you get some basic boilerplate um, code. So it's, it's very easy to start uh, developing something that is uh, meaningful. You know, you get the standard boilerplate stuff, you get your license header. Um, of course, for the license header, you just need to go to settings and it's a setting called file header. Um, you just edit that setting and it's, it's just a set of lines um, that it'll be inserting into the actual source file. So um, there's settings to generally do most things and um, really easy to get started. Um, okay, so we have this. Let's um, add this class uh, to this other item class I have. So I have item.java here. It's actually uh, a field class. So the idea behind the field class is um, it, in this particular case, essentially, I, I permit only certain uh, classes to extend it. And in this way, um, these classes are sort of, um, it's almost like a, you can think of a, an enumeration where only these particular instances uh, can extend this one. So let's add um, my class to it. So another way we could kind of look this up is we could go into the main source file and let's just quickly right click on item. Oops. Right click on item. We'll go to peak. Or actually, let's just go to show type hierarchy. So this is another relatively uh, recent feature that um, we have. So we can instantly show the type hierarchy for a particular uh, type. So we can click on individual entries and you know just browse them as you sort of expect and get an idea of uh, what it looks like. So in our case, uh, let's extend this. We'll make this extend. We should be getting some errors here, but in particular, we'll get an error on item, I believe. Don't see that. Okay, so we'll add the core here as another class that is permitted. And I think we just have to decide to make uh, the core final here. Um, another way we could have done this very easily is just um, within item, we could have just gone to the core, uh, right click and go to peak, uh, peak definition. So maybe it's a little convenient sometimes to just keep the context on a particular class and uh, manipulate it uh, this way. So this is also a possibility. Okay. So now we've added the core here. So let's go back to item. Oops, actually, I want to go back to main. So what you can see happened here is we actually, we have an error. And the reasoning for this is because the static analysis, uh, at least my understanding of it is, it has detected that um, our uh, sealed class and our case statement doesn't cover every possible uh, case now. It did before, uh, but it doesn't now. So what we need to do is add a case for the core. We can just uh, type this out. Uh, the core. Yes. Now, one of the things I just realized is we actually haven't written any uh, methods or fields for the core. So let's do that. We'll just uh, right click is giving me a little trouble. Um, so we'll go into the core and we'll just, you know, create, um, I guess we can call it a type or something like that, or um, room type, let's say. And maybe another one. Ah, let's just leave it as one. So let's say we want to generate uh, some getters and setters for this. Um, there's a bunch of different ways we can do this. Uh, we can do it directly from the field, so we can create getter and setter like that. Um, we can do it from the type declaration itself by just uh, hitting generate getters and setters. And uh, additionally, we can actually do it while we're typing. So um, I have room type here, but I can actually type get room type, which doesn't exist, but it's just a completion that automatically generates um, the 
methods for them. So again, we do have relatively um, convenient ways of um, you know getting your code up and running, getting boilerplate code out there. And there's there's multiple ways sometimes of doing one thing. It just comes to uh, what your preference is. So let's um, add a label here. Oops. See if I get the label. Right. And you can see that uh, the error has actually disappeared because now um, we're using a switch expression with pattern matching and we're essentially spanning um, every possible class that uh, item could uh, implement. Um, another thing kind of just worth showing off, um, generally speaking, when we're, maybe we have a particular type in mind and we're uh, just typing it out, um, let's do it this way, we're actually going to this. Uh, we have issues where it comes to, you know, resolving those types. So one of the nice things, oh, semicolon. So essentially what I just did there, I, I just hit save and the types were automatically imported. Um, the way to go about this, again, it's a setting, you go to file preferences settings, it's organize uh, imports, and you can just um, enable uh, organizing the imports on save. Um, if you want it to be even more fancy, you could make it so that the actual save event itself uh, happens at a fixed interval. And um, just a really convenient way to um, quickly get your imports in without having too much fuss about you know, going up to the top of the file or anything like that. Okay, just making sure. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right, perfect. Um, okay, so yeah, just really, really convenient to get things going and have things working. So with that out of the way, um, another thing I can also show off is we're always looking to improve um, just the kind of convenient fixes we have, particularly as new language features come along. Um, as an example, um, you know, you can convert certain types to var, things like that. So um, it's in, in terms of completions and quick fixes, our, our goal is definitely to make it easier for developers as well to support and be aware of the latest features. Um, and we're always working to hopefully make that a little easier. Um, so now let's shift over to, um, you know, dependencies, things like that. So when you have a basic project like this, um, you know, it, it's really straightforward to get your dependencies. Usually it's, um, you just put them in a lib folder. Um, this is configurable. Um, so let me just quickly show that. I can go to file preferences settings. And I believe it's called, actually, let me go into the workspace settings as opposed to user settings. It's uh, called, uh, what is it? Java project uh, reference libraries. So in this way, I can just complete this. And you can see this is uh, the default value, which is essentially any jar um, under the lib folder. But what you can also do um, for some more advanced usage is you can list specifically each uh, jar to include, even um, excludes, and you can also uh, have a mapping between each particular library and the corresponding sources. Um, so there's, there's a lot of advanced capabilities um, in the event that you do wanna take a very simple project and kind of um, beef it up and have it be a little more advanced and support more complicated use cases. So we can do both. Um, in this particular case, um, even our unmanaged projects have support for um, resolving source files. So if I just click on JSON here, um, again, we were taken directly to the uh, sources for this. Again, you see the comments. And uh, the way this is essentially done is as long as you're using uh, a library originating from Maven Central, we just get at that metadata and we can get the corresponding uh, source file for that. Um, it's also fairly responsive in the sense that, um, let's say I want to just add another library, Guava. Um, hopefully you can see the terminal here, so I will expand it just a little bit. I'll just move Guava into the lib folder. 
And you should be able to see that yeah, I instantly have access to the sources. Oh, sorry, I have access to the library. Now I have access to the sources as well. So it, it's really, it, it starts off as a very basic project, but there's a lot of support for more advanced usages, uh, just based on what users have uh, requested and uh, wanted. Um, I don't really have anything else I would mention, unless someone has anything in particular they would want me to um, look at. I will say that in particular for future releases, we are um, improving support for uh, Maven and Gradle projects. One of the things that our users were not huge fans of um, was that when you do import that project, um, there are metadata files that are generated as part of that process. And they were definitely not happy with seeing those in their projects. So we, we have a solution now where uh, those files will not be generated in the user's actual project. Um, and I, I, I really, I really enjoyed just checking those into Git and then and checking them out and then destroying them and then deleting them. No, I didn't. I'm so glad that you've actually uh, added that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's it was a little interesting because from my point of view, it, it sort of felt like you know the project has many dot files and hidden files. So you know what's another two? But if, if people don't <laughs> want it, there there are ways to you know give that. Um, additionally, for certain quick fixes uh, or certain errors, we've made it so it's a little more easy to actually discover them. So from going forward, you won't have to be on the on the diagnostic itself or on the squiggly line. Um, you'll be able to do it from anywhere on the line. Um, there's some cases for better handling of out of memory issues. So detecting when the language server runs out of memory and um, giving the user options to recover from that a little more elegantly. Um, handling the actual cleaning of workspace metadata. So as you can imagine, if you have a, a large project with many libraries, we do a bit of indexing um, to make it easier to look things up. Those indices can grow. So um, we're slowly getting towards reducing the size of that workspace metadata, just because you know if you open new projects all the time, it can get rather large. Um, more quick fixes, quick assists based on, uh, you know, new language features. And um, yeah, I think also as well, better support in terms of um, out of the box. So um, if your system doesn't have Java installed, we'll have a solution where uh, once you have the V6 extension installed, you'll be able to, to work off of a, a version that's provided. Yeah, that's essentially my demo. If you have any questions or want to see me break this in a particular way or <laughs> have a burning desire to see something i'm happy to show but otherwise i'll, I'll hand yeah. it off to rory great thank you so much and yeah folks if you've got anything you want to let's bring roland back on and break uh just leave a message in the comments under this video we'll get in touch and uh, with that i will turn it over to rory who's got a ton of passion about this project and loves free tooling yeah so i started my journey with microsoft about 10 years ago with the Java language server, because at the time I needed to find a nice way to, uh, you know, uh, teach Java to a lot of developers. And at the time it was only expensive IDEs or very heavyweight IDEs. So when the Java language server came, um, I was fascinated with it. And I did a lot of talks around it. And Microsoft noticed me speaking on that. And it's one of the reasons why I joined them and they approached me uh, is the language server. So I go all the way back and it means very dear to me. So I've got a really nice demo I'm going to show today. I'm going to go back into it. I'm going to get really geeky on, on how it works. And I'm going to showcase the Red Hat language server and how it works with the language server protocol. So I should have shared my screen. Um, and uh, Matt, if you can bring it in there. Okay, so this is how under the hood. And, you know, uh, my wife says to me, there's a sound in my car. It's going duck, 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 duck. And I, it's been like that for a month. I go, oh my gosh, no, no, you didn't. So I always, I always like to know what's going on underneath the hood. And this is what's going on uh, underneath the hood. So you can see here, here's your development tool. Uh, and I've got my little mouse laser there. Uh, here's your development tool. And this is the language server protocol, which uses uh, JSON RPC. Now this site here is the uh, microsoft.github.com forward slash language dash server dash protocol. Um, and it's something that Microsoft co-engineered, and it's a, a definition using Jack's JSON RPC to speak from your development tool to a language server. So all the way back, Microsoft needed a, um, a remote tooling interface for their Monaco 
uh, web editor. Now, Monaco eventually came Visual Studio Code and also GitHub Code Spaces. And the Visual Studio language server protocol was baked in there. And it allowed people then to go, okay, user opens document or edits the document. And then JSON will be sent through to the language server. And then notifications will be sent back to give them some indication around what they need to do. Now, you might be thinking, wait a second, why does this do it? Um, and the reason for that is because there's something called the matrix of complexity. Now, the matrix of complexity says, and that's my uh, next little slide here, sorry, there we go. The matrix of complexity says that if I wanna speak to an HTML language server and also a PHP language server, I can actually do it in the same window. If I wanna speak to a Java, or a C sharp, I can do it in the same window. I also don't need different tools. Like if you want to use C sharp prior to this, you use Visual Studio. If you wanted to use Java, you used IntelliJ. Now with the language server, you can use both at the same time because the language server itself sits out of process, running away from your IDE. It is not literally in your IDE and it talks to your IDE via JSON. So all of your IDE just needs to speak JSON and it can do all of those things that a full-fledged IDE does, which means that uh, Atom, Vim, Emacs, uh, Eclipse, uh, VS Code, all of these things can speak to language server and it's becoming the de facto uh, 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 basics for IDEs to speak in the language server because it gives them the ability to take that matrix of complexity and make it much uh, easier. So this is, um, it's a big thunderstorm over here. This is code.visualstudio.com forward slash API forward slash language dash extensions. And all of these links will be up uh, after the session. So this is uh, going and showing the language server extensions. Now I wanna show you exactly how it works. So first I'm gonna show you a nice little example with the LSM samples. So you can go to microsoft.com on github.com and then go to VS Code dash extension dash samples. And there's a lot of samples here on how to get uh, started with Visual Studio Code. There's code actions, there's code lens, the configuration changes. So I wanna show you the LSM example. And in this there, we've got a client folder, which is the client that is going to be uh, uh, calling the server, which is your language server and getting all that lovely JSON back. And then you've got the server there, which is going to be passing and sending it back. So in our example, we're just gonna use a text-based language server because I don't wanna show you the, the full Java language server until a little bit later in my demo. So let's go through and see exactly what we've got. So here's our, our LSM example. And in our LSM example, we've got a client and the client really just starts up a, a Visual Studio Code instance and then lets you type into uh, plain text. The server then will uh, go in and pass uh, the uh, instructions and then return back by JSON all of the instructions that you can actually do. And then the client will say, oh, I can do this and that, I'm gonna go and tell the user. So the two examples that we've got here is uh, on completion and it's gonna say, uh, when you type in there, it's going to give IntelliSense to say, if you do TYP for TypeScript, then it's gonna complete that word uh, and completion item dot kind. It's also going to complete JavaScript, the word. And then if you type something in uppercase or lowercase, it is going to actually go in and give you uh, some uh, documentation for that uppercase or uh, lowercase. So how do I start this? So first of all, on my terminal, I've already kind of compiled everything. So you need to do an npm install and all of this is in, available in the readme.md. So you need to do an, an npm install and then you need to compile the, the client and server, which I've already done. And then after that, you're just gonna launch the client. And the launch, with the minute the client launches up, it's gonna create a server instance for you. I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna go uh, launch client and it's gonna launch a, a client in another window, like you saw there. And now I've got a, a little text editor there. And um, you can see there, I've got a little text editor untitled a text. And I am going to go in and type some JavaScript. Uh, it didn't like that. Let's go, uh, don't save. Let's go uh, open folder and let's create a new folder there. So we're gonna create a new folder here and I'm gonna call that Matt uh, for, uh, oh, it's already taken Matt, uh, RPZA. Uh, and we're gonna go open here and we're gonna go in and create a, a little text file. So new file here and we're gonna call that, uh, let's go new file and test.txt. 
60. There we go, plain text, cool. Now, if we got the Java, there we go. So the language server now, as soon as I go uh, Java, you can see at the bottom there, uh, GitHub Copilot, I switched it off, but the plain text language server that we've, uh, we've defined when we compiled it is actually running. And now it's going to go, cool, you want to compile, you want to finish up there, I can just finish up JavaScript, I can finish up TypeScript, it's going to give me those, those options there. And I can also, if I right click over TypeScript there, and I look at, uh, if I go into JavaScript, you can see there, I've got the JavaScript documentation. So that's how the language server works. At the same time, it's sending back JSON as I type in, as I'm doing that. And uh, it does that uh, on mass for the Java language server. So that's the one demo that I'm going to show you. And just, uh, you can, let's stop our language server there. And that's going to stop the client also. And uh, we can actually uh, close that. Now, the next thing I want to show you is how the, jang the language server works. Now, the language server goes uh, on steroids. So you can see here, this is the uh, VS Code. Let's go into here. And this is the actual language server. So you can go to Red Hat dash developer VS Code dash Java. It's a big project. And it's got uh, a lot of those, those little formatters and tools there to actually get it working. So um, in this example, let's just close here and I want to close that there. In this example here, um, I've got my source action. So you know like you when you go getters and setters? So there's a source action here and you can see there that I can get uh, my custom uh, assessor items, assessor.map, and then it's going to get the getters and setters based on those field descriptions. And it's got all of the kind of tasks that you, you would expect for your Java language server here. So it's got it in the actual command. So if, you've got, if you go into uh, commands, it's going to go into all of those. Uh, no, no, that's the wrong thing here. I want to go and there's the not build path, uh, document symbols, extensions, uh, paste action, uh, and uh, let's go get a nice uh, juicy one here, uh, refactor actions, there we go. So when you refactor, you can go assign variable, extract constant, uh, extract field, and these are JSON uh, 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 protocols, uh, little snippets that we're gonna send back. Now I'm gonna switch this on, and I'm gonna use a project um, for uh, my demo called the Spring Pet Linux. It's a very easy uh, project there, and it's uh, maintained by one of our partners, uh, Pivotal, and I've opened this up now, and this Spring Pet Clinic project um, is, uh, let's go back into here. So I'm going to go code, uh, open in GitHub code spaces. I mean, sorry, not code spaces. Um, and then go open in Visual Studio Code. There it is. And okay, let me just open this here. Open recent, and I'm going to go Pet Clinic. There we go. Here's the Pet Clinic here. Now, if I open up the Pet Clinic, you'll notice that the first thing it's going to do, it's going to go open a Java project. It's going to start the Java language server. So it's a little process running in, uh, you know, compiled JavaScript running in Electron, because, you know, the, everything that we see here is actually JavaScript. Um, and it's going to go then compile, and it's going to wait for events from my, uh, my IDE to send through to the J language server, and then the language server is going to send back. So one of those events then obviously is going to be the refactor. So you can go refactor here. You don't see it here, but it's sending all of that information to give me all of those fields that I can access, extract a field, extract a method, extract a local variable. So wouldn't it be great to actually switch that on and see exactly what it's sending? So there is a way to switch that on. And you need to set, uh, set verbose mode on the Java language server protocol. So you can go into your settings. So you've got the Java coding pack installed for uh, for uh, Java, um, just like we showed you earlier. You can go file, um, uh, sorry, code, preferences, and settings into your settings there. And then you're gonna go java.lang, uh, uh, I think that's java.lang, there we go. And I wanna find the Java language server there. There we go, java.trace.server. Now I'm gonna switch it on. Understand there's a lot of information I'm about to switch on. So you only do this when you really wanna go and, and debug and play around with it. So I'm gonna switch it on and it gives you messages. So it will tell you every time it sends a message or back. And then there's verbose. I'm gonna switch on verbose. So I'm gonna switch on verbose and then I'm gonna go in and uh, I'm gonna go save that there. I don't think I need to save it, but let's just save it just in case. So now everything is verbose. Now I'm going to actually go in and say, well, uh, my, my previous code, I got getters and setters, so let me just uh, clear the output here. So if I right click on run and I go uh, refactor, I should get, and right at the bottom here, 
all of the Jason, look at that. Look how much there. All of the Jason there, it says, okay, cool. You've got uh, range. You can start there on the text document. Uh, refract to move. So the move button then will uh, go in and uh, highlight the start range of 31. So that's 31. Uh, let's just see here. Yeah, th 31. Um, and 31 is going to go to uh, line 30, 31, which is there character 22 to 22. So that's where you're going to actually move the, the class though. So 31, so that's the main method there. So it's gonna actually go in, in that example there, it's gonna move, main, move the main method. So you can see there arguments, move static member. And it's saying to me that that's where it's gonna go. So you can see that it's even instructing exactly where the, the, the actual IDE needs to go in and move what method and where it's going to go in, um, and move it though. So if I right click there and go refactor, and I can go inline method or move. It's gonna say, where do you wanna actually move this to? And all of that examples is already given to me in the JSON. You can see how incredibly verbose it is now uh, around that there. So change modifiers to, to final, and that really is the language server. And at the same time, if you go into your task man manager here, so if I go into um, the activity viewer here, and uh, let me see if I can get this here. So let me. You can view it there. Have you ever wondered why there's an extra uh, process view uh, when you actually start start that up uh, there? Wait, where, where are you now? Uh, there we go. Okay, so let's go find our process view. I think that the, the restream doesn't like it though. But when you actually start up, let's go quit there and let's, let's start that up again. There we go. And when you start this up and you go into your process name, you can actually find the Java language server. And if you go here and I'm gonna type in Java, so there's my Java language. You can see that there's two processes. There's Java there, um, and then there's the, another Java process uh, there. One of those is actually the language server. So you've got the process of the RDE running and um, getting ready for Java, but you've also got another Java process server that sits out there that runs all of that. It, it compiles your code, it does refactoring, it does so much more that you don't understand there. And this is what happens when you have multiple Java language servers. You can have a C sharp one, uh, an HTML one, all running at the same time. And I can actually prove it to you. So in this, this project here, um, I've got a, uh, no, I want to go back there and I want to go to the pet clinic. Uh, let's go here and we're going to go spring pet clinic. So remember pet, spring pet clinic is here, right? I've got the Java language server running right now, but then I go into uh, 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 the readme.md and it's going to start up. You can see the activating extension. Now I'm in Markdown. That's a language server. It's a language server running there, but I didn't have to have a different IDE. It just create a, a language server on the side for me to do it and to doing the exact same thing. So every time I go into the markdown here, it's gonna send JSON through and through and you don't even notice that. And that's the power and that's really why I saw all those years ago, 10 years ago, uh, the power of the language server and slowly but surely all the IDEs are migrating to that language server. And that's everything I wanted to show you. I think I'm on time. And thanks again, Red Hat, for creating such an incredible technology. Thanks so much. That was uh, you love your power, uh, but uh, these are these are great tools that definitely make the developer experience better. Um, I'm going to put up a couple more links here right at the end. We've got the uh, there's the Microsoft blog uh, where you can learn more about this, and then we'll put up the link to the Red Hat blog as well. And we'll put all the links that we've shared uh, down below. And if you've got any questions, as always, feel free to just either leave a comment here on, uh, oh, did I show that one? Okay, making sure I've got my links coming up correctly there. Uh, leave a comment here in the on YouTube or else just send mail to msusdev at microsoft.com and we'll get you in touch with the experts and get your questions answered. And uh, again, thanks so much to everyone. So, so so we might also want to show the, did we show the Red Hat repo, the, the VS Code Java repo in the end? Uh, the VS Code Java repo, yes. I'll go I'll put that up one more time. Yeah. So just so everyone's got it here. Yep. That's the one, right? Yep. yep, that's right. Go grab the stuff and uh, play and uh, file issues, make it better. And uh, thanks to the community yeah, for uh, this great experience. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Thanks, everyone. See you next time. Yeah.
Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Right. Cheers, Thank everyone. You See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.